I know a surprising number of young Catholic converts, people who have felt so dispirited by mainstream culture and actually are, are longing for something clearer mm. and more deliberately rigid. Something that doesn't just look like the culture around them in that sense. Yes, and it seems to offer access to the wisdom of the past. We have been duped into rejecting the wisdom of the ancient past, which is why I'm glad you are here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm joined by my friend Sam. Both of us went through the same classical program in graduate school. We both work in ministry. And even though this conversation starts with a little bit of a critique of the current state of the church, I really think it's for everyone who's on a quest for meaning and a search for belonging and truth. And really, like, how do we live in this world given the current state of things? So looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this conversation, reading your comments. Let's get into it. Jesus is going to be the Lord of my life. He has to be the Lord of all my life, including my sex life. Um, but I, I have some bitterness that I had to do this almost entirely on my own because mm -hmm. there was no help in my church or my churches. And so is that part of the, the Benedict option in a sense, is being full and frank about the challenges and what it means to live a chaste life as far as you're concerned? Yeah, absolutely. And the church because... needs to have those you know, awkward conversations. With it people. does seem to have the awkward conversations and not be apologetic for what it teaches. Mm. Now, I, my wife grew up in a... Okay, so yeah, they're starting this conversation in the... It, it, this is kind of an example. He's talking about living this chaste life and that the church yep. was not equipped to help him. That's really the, the context to this, really the next part of this, which we want to... Uh, maybe talk more in depth on, but but why is it that the church was not equipped to ha to help someone live uh, like harmoniously, you know, going back to Jordan Peterson and the idea of the Bible uh, giving us the structure for society and culture. Um, it, it's, it's ironic that this person, you know, it's like I went to the church for that guidance and they couldn't give it to me. Yeah the church itself has lost the ability to help people orientate their lives according to God's revelation. A fundamentalist Protestant church uh, where she said sex was talked about very negatively if it was talked mm -hmm. about at all. Now that's wrong too. Sex in traditional Christian teaching, sex is a good thing, but it, it, it has to be channeled in a way that is life-giving and holy. The church knows how to do this. It just needs to quit uh, being so afraid of The Guardian and The New York Times and actually stand openly and unapologetically for what for, for the wisdom of the ages and the wisdom of Scripture. But, but very often, you know... Okay, they need to stand unapologetically for the wisdom of the ages. I don't know that it's the church that's afraid of The Guardian and these newspapers. I think the church is just, in, in some ways, um, lost that classical imagination and lost that yeah. dialogue, lost the ability to have that dialogue within culture, within society. Yeah, and there may be um, just the, the he, he mentions the wisdom of the ages mm -hmm. and the teaching of the church in the same breath, like they rhyme, Yeah, which they should. Yeah, And there's a sense in which, it's hard to talk about the church or a church or some churches or whatever, but let's just, it's, it's us. Yeah. The, the uh, we, you know, if we, if we are disconnected with the wisdom of the ages, which mm. are not, not the source of the church's teaching, but a result of truth, which is what the church teaches. Right. Um, you know, yeah. we are going to be kind of just dancing around some of these issues. I mean, his example of, you know, sexual ethics or, or yeah. whatever. It's like, if we feel like we have to invent it ourselves, or if we're yeah. like, well, well, what does that mean today? What does that mean now? And it's like, well, if there's fundamental foundational truths, then it means what it's mm. always meant. Yeah, um, and, and and the more mm. the more dislocated we can we become from those mm -hmm. fundamental or classical, you know, mm -hmm. truths, uh, the we lose the ability to speak with potency and power to the actual issue that the person. Yeah is encountering for this guy you know it was this this sexual ethic it could mm -hmm. be gender it could be abortion mm -hmm. you know like we and which is so unfortunate because the church 
again kind of maybe capital c church if you will yeah, yeah. it is is the we're curating the tr truth we're the people of truth mm -hmm. and we're the people of the word and we're supposed to steward that that truth that knowledge well and it just mm -hmm. doesn't seem like maybe we have most people will think especially here in the uk but i'm sure in parts of the us as well well the problem with the church is it's always seen to have been you know anti this anti that you know prudish and uh, and reactionary and so on and and to hear rod saying well we need to actually embrace the distinctives of the mm. christian sexual ethic a lot of churches and christians might run a mile from that and say that's not the way to engage the culture saying we stand against this we should thou shalt not and so on i mean what it, i don't know where, where what should we be for we should we should be known for what we're mm -hmm. for not known for what we're we're against in other words yeah whether you feel like that's that's something actually ca in a counterintuitive way young people today's generation might embrace being given the challenge of a, a quite traditional christian sexual ethic or, or whether actually it is going to you know, if people weren't likely to darken the door of a church, they never will if, if that's what's being kind of put on offer, Louise. What do you think? The assumption from um, <clears throat> from many British Christians and from the Church of England in general is that, yes, the church has to come to meet the progressive culture and that liberalising church teachings is the way to get people through the door. I suppose maybe in some circumstances that might be working but you know i know a surprising number of young catholic converts people who have um felt so dispirited by mainstream culture and actually are are longing for a more um something clearer mm. and more deliberately rigid something that doesn't just look like the culture around them in that sense. yes and it seems to offer um access to the wisdom of the past to a kind of confidence something that calls sureness. them out of themselves access to the wisdom of the past yeah uh you know again having gone through a classical program when i heard her say that um, I, I always appreciate, I always find a lot of value when people help me put words to things that I think. Yeah. Because it's yeah. like, okay, I, I, I felt that more than I knew how to communicate it. And when she said that, I was like, that's it. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's not just that people want rigid laws to follow. No. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a, a sense in which, you know, she, she said that there's a camp saying that liberalizing church teaching mm. is the way to go um and she contrasts that with this tradition this rigid tradition that gives access to the wisdom of the past mm. which means like when she's talking about liberalizing she's talking about an uprooting like a disconnecting it's like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is this very present tense this is very modern this is right. very up to date um, but it is counter to, it is against, it is opposed to the access to the wisdom of the past, mm -hmm. to something, something eternal, to something actually right. eternal. Yeah. Well, and Which this is and insightful. It, it, it really is. And this takes us to what's, what Steve is going to say, carrying on that conversation from Louise Perry, young people wanting access to the wisdom of the past. Mm -hmm. Is it... You know, Steve's going to talk a little bit about modernity, and I wonder, is that like the gatekeeper today, the thing that discourages young people from looking back into something like Homer, uh, something like Socrates? Uh, again, there's, there's just a, there is a disconnect in that sense that we have not inherited that classical yeah. education. We, we rejected it. I don't know. What do you say? Like 60 years ago, hundred years ago, something like that. Something um, like that. Yeah. And so young people don't have a guide to bring them into that classical conversation um, or elevate their classical imagination. Um, mm -hmm. And modernity is standing there saying, it's all, it's all junk anyway. You don't want to go there. You don't want to, you don't want to read old books. Yeah. That's, there's no value there anymore. Um, and yet those are the same young people that are just, they're trying to orientate themselves to reality and don't have the tools to do that. So, 
All right. Yeah, this is good. To... Yeah, you want to yeah. listen to Steve? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Steve Jack, Knox Online Program Director for the Master of Arts in Christian and Classical Studies. And I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you to the program. And this, the foundational course, Plato and Augustine. Now, the so the way Knox used to formulate their course, and, and for the sake of context, anybody watching this, this mm -hmm. is old. This is old Knox. Knox does not yeah. teach. Uh, Steve is no longer live. Uh, the program's organized differently. It's organized the program's differently. there, but it's organized different. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve's not there. Uh, mm -hmm. Gage isn't there. All, all that. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I thought was so interesting about this is that they set everything up as a dialogue. Plato mm -hmm. and Augustine, Aquinas and Aristotle, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. And f for me, particularly in my work with youth, young people, uh, the absence of dialogue is so obvious. Like young people do not know how to carry on a conversation. And I just love that um, Knox formulated their program this way, at least when I was going through it. And I, that's one of the things I hope to do with this channel is basically formulate dialogues between Schaefer and, and Jordan Peterson or whoever it might be. Right. Um, so I just love that. I just love that emphasis on dialogue, yeah. emphasis on yeah, conversation. Yeah, and it, it, it's important to see whatever you read or watch or listen to or whatever to be part of a dialogue because when people are making claims, they're responding mm -hmm. to something. Mm -hmm. Like you were born too late too yeah. long after the creation of the universe to be starting the conversation like you're right. you're not you're responding yeah. to something and so get that other person on the stage mm -hmm. with you those other ideas and then you can have some real you know well, meaningful and, interaction yeah and having meaningful mm -hmm. interaction with ideas that challenge mm -hmm. you that cause you to think differently yeah. you're not in your own echo yeah. chamber with your own group of people you know right. um and, th and that's yeah. what, that's what <laughs> well, they, I, I mean, one of the yeah. classes you didn't mention is, uh, what is it? It's Dante and Machiavelli. Ooh, and yeah. it's like, what, what Protestant reformed <laughs> seminaries? Like you guys got to get into the Machiavelli and you're like, what? Is yeah. That, yeah. What are we doing? But it's, it's important. Like, this is how, it's, this is where th thought not comes from, but yeah. it's part of the journey of Western thought. Well, and, and again, I'm, I'm going out on a little bit of a limb there, you know, mm -hmm. the, the internet gurus out there might, might challenge me, mm -hmm. but if we didn't have, uh, the Prince, if we didn't have Machiavelli, would we have Hitler? Would we have the Ubermensch? Would we have right. those ideas? Um, aren't they conversant with each other? Aren't they building yeah. off it? So if, so if you're like, oh, why did this thing happen in Europe at this time with mm -hmm. this guy named Adolf? Well, the seeds of that were planted maybe yeah. with Machiavelli. The seeds of that were yeah. planted with, you know, you go, yeah, go back I don't know. and keep, that's why we have yeah. to find where we start. Yeah. 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 And if, if not, if not the source, if not saying like, right. oh, it's Machiavelli's fault. Mm. Well, even if, if that's not it, he gives you a lens through which to view the horrors yep. of the 20th century yep. and when we talk about like senseless violence it's like right. well someone thought it was sensible yeah yeah this guy yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and and uh and the i mean the one for me that always sticks with me is mm -hmm. is the nietzsche dostoevsky conversation because mm -hmm. of the the is it the divine inquisitor the grand inquisitor in the grand inquisitor yeah. in the brothers karamazov yeah yeah um, and then the, the madman, you know, the, oh gosh, just the God, the whole God yeah. is dead moment and Nietzsche kind of seeing that a lot of people are going to die again. This kind of goes back to mm -hmm. our, our initial video where, uh, the stakes of this great conversation are like really high. Yeah. The, the poet and the philosopher, uh, uh, Aristophanes and Socrates, I mean, Aristophanes basically got Socrates killed. I mean, it, the yeah. stakes are pretty high. And I think Nietzsche mm -hmm. understood that. He's like, hey, if God's dead, then-, then There's going to be fallout. Then we're God <laughs> yeah. and, and we're not going to do a very good job. <laughs> so, Have you met right. people? Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> okay. All right, back to Steve. The method of this course, and in fact, the program at large, is you're going to be participating in the great conversation. 
a dialogue from some of the greatest minds and noblest ideas spanning the past 25 centuries or so that have largely informed Western Christian civilization, philosophy, and thought. You're going to be participating in the great conversation largely by reading the great books. And for the most part, you're going to be reading these books in their entirety and not limited to somebody else's commentary. As Dr. Gage has said on many occasions, Plato is your instructor, as is Aristotle and Dante and Thucydides and Tocqueville and Shakespeare. Now, Dr. Gage's experience and expertise will open up these texts to you in a unique and inspiring way. But make no mistake, your instructors are Plato and Augustine. And, well, and I think this goes back to the, the idea of, of having guides in this process, right? I, I appreciate, yes, I want to learn from Augustine. Uh, I don't know how. <laughs> right? So I need a, a Dr. Gage. I need a Louise Cowan. I need a, you know, um, was it Luis Marcos who's over at, um, right. yeah. uh, who's over in, um, what is it? Yeah. And it's not Dallas. It's not Dallas. I that's what I got locked on Luis right. Cowan in Dallas. Louise Dallas. Cowan. Um, yeah. he's in, um, the, the other Texas place, Houston, Houston. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. other people, um, mm -hmm. Uh, Michael Heiser, you know, some of these other guys that, yeah. that help you connect the dots along the way. Um, yeah. I don't know. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, again, this kind of goes to our conversation about how do we get, how do we in particular get young people uh, engaged in this if they, you know, it's almost like you have to have a guide, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we both know, maybe from experience prior to this kind of education or just observation, that there's like there's definitely a wrong way to do it. Hmm. Um, I mean, we know that like handing someone a book about the thing and then walking away is probably the worst. And then we both agree like, well, just if you want to know, if you want to know these guys, like read the sources, you know, yeah. ad fontes, like yeah. read those things. But if you would just walk away, you're only like one step above you know, the, the worst case scenario, like just leaving me with the city of God right. by Augustine of Hippo. Like that's not super helpful, even though mm. I know how to read. Um, <laughs> so like the, the importance of dialogue is, is important. Uh, and then having, if one of those people can be wise, all the yeah. better. <laughs> well, and one of the <laughs> things the that frustrated me mm -hmm. in my undergrad was taking a philosophy class and never reading any of the original sources. Oh, I know. You know, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna read yeah. this essay on Immanuel Kant. Okay. Yeah. But are we gonna read any of Immanuel yeah. Kant? Oh uh, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> right. So again, there's these sort of gatekeepers yeah. that are well, Lewis yeah. again. Yeah, Lewis talks about that in uh, it's the introduction to Athanasius uh, on the Incarnation. Okay. You know, so it's this book, this work of theology written in like the, you know, fourth century. And it's pretty accessible. And Lewis wrote an introduction to it saying, mm. you know, read old books. Yeah. And he was saying that everyone's surprised when they re find out that reading Plato is actually way easier than reading mm. any book about Plato. And right. that's true. Like yeah. the dialogues are yeah. pretty, sh most of them are short. A couple mm -hmm. of them aren't. Um but like going going to the actual sources is important. But again, I'd say it's probably not enough. Yeah. If you're doing it by yourself, like there's a need for the community and need for a guide. And I will say, mm -hmm. um, the help that Doctor Gage gave me during this yeah. program, it was just enough. It was just mm -hmm. enough to allow me to read Plato, it and begin to understand okay, I, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then that carries on to the next book that you read and carries on to the next book that you read. So I think, yeah, you do need a right. guide, but maybe that guide is very uh, intentional with how yeah. they guide you. They're not just telling you what to think. Yeah. They're making now we, the text we could get into, We could get into like homeschool philosophy, right? Right from there, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's something that like my my brothers and I are thankful for because we were my my mom educated mm -hmm. us 
Um, and then what we're trying to do with our, our kids so much is just make them self-educating people. Yeah. You know, it's like, did you teach me stuff? Not a whole bunch, but you taught me how to learn. Yeah. And like, that's going to be more yeah. valuable. And that's something yeah. that's definitely in the classics, you know, in the great conversation is, I mean, that's a lot of Socrates is teaching yeah. people how to ask mm -hmm. questions, how to learn stuff. Yeah. So, well, and I wonder if this yeah. takes us back to, to the conversation about why the church is not equipped to help mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. We, yeah. it, and, and again, you can, you, people will disagree with this and that's fine. And I'd love to hear comments. I'd love to read comments on this, but, but it seems like the church has gotten into the habit of just telling people what to think and not telling yeah. people how to think, telling people mm -hmm. what to believe about the Bible and not telling them how to read the Bible. And so you get somebody who comes to church and says, Hey, I want to I want to live, uh, with a, with a biblical sexual ethic and I need you to help me do that. And they're like, well, I don't, uh, well, what's, let's find a curriculum on that. You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. or we could got to be a better way. <laughs> yeah. We could, we sure. could be uh, equipped to read the Bible ourselves and think for ourselves and then help this person read the Bible for themselves and think for themselves. Um, and we've kind of departed from that. And, um, maybe that, and again, I'm not trying to be too harsh on modernity and blame modernity for everything, but maybe is that part of our uh, this is part of modern the inheritance? Maybe. Yeah. All right, more more Steve. And we're not okay. we don't rely on somebody else's commentary. You're going to be reading these books in their entirety. You're going to be reading these books in an appropriate order. You might not be aware that the order that you approach these works matters. This is a lesson that has been lost uh, on many of today's uh, college campuses and universities. Um, Aristotle said that all of knowledge is interrelated. He called it the organon. There is an interconnection and interrelatedness to knowledge. Plato said knowledge is hierarchical. There is a guiding principle in classical education that the oldest things matter the most. And so in this program, you're going to start from the beginning and build from there. I love that. Mm -hmm. The oldest things matter the most. So the, the, the uh, easy pitch softball question is like, well, then where do you begin? Yeah. At the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would you begin with Genesis? You know, okay. Where would you begin? Uh, yeah, well, you would begin probably with yeah, Genesis and John. Yeah. In the beginning. Yeah. That's, I mean, those it, are the, yeah. Which takes us to Jordan Peterson. You know, it, jo right. Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, Russell mm -hmm. Brand. The, those are some of the interlocutors mm -hmm. of this channel. That's kind right. of the vision there. Um, and and I think one of the reasons why Jordan Peterson has become, I don't know, interesting or or some of the um, some of the value of what he's saying and some of the weight of his language and his words comes from the fact that he's commenting on scripture, and yeah. he's basically saying. Hey, this is fundamental. This is foundational. Mm -hmm. If we can't get this, yeah. Yeah. the reason we can't get understand what's going on today is that we don't understand these older things. This particularly, like he's doing the Exodus story right now, right? Um, and excuse me, as I knock my desk around, um, I just love that. I and maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm built that way. But I just love the ancient things. I love ancient history. I love the classic works, um, I feel like they're very important, way more important yeah. than the modern yeah. things. I feel like lots of, you can see this in how like things are built today. And, and mm -hmm. Schaefer talks oh, yeah. about this with art, you know, there's this, yeah. this sense of apathy that appears in the arts as you lose meaning. Um, and yeah. Yeah, you could do a whole episode on uh, bad architecture. I would show up for that, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> well, maybe and maybe a, an episode on bad education, right? Because that's what yeah. Steve that's what Steve is talking yeah. about here in this this past. Sure. Is that we're not the the whole? Um, I don't know if that's maybe I'm being too general here, but a lot of university this the whole structure of like modern education again maybe mm -hmm. too general, but is is not based around the idea that knowledge is interrelated. You segment right. out little bits of knowledge. Very specialized. It's very specialized. Yeah. Go take your class mm -hmm. on whatever math it is. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that conversation, that, that class on math has no conversation, um, does, not, does not interrelate with your class on music. Yeah. And yet. Yeah, which is why, 
Yeah, you have STEM, STEM education. Maybe this belongs in the right. in the other conversation. Uh, but you have a real emphasis on sciences, just mm. you know, uh, science, um, and that that family of knowledge without uh, the arts, which is really kind of an inroads into ethics. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly you have unethical mm. scientists. <laughs> how? How, how did, did that get there? happen? Oh no! Yeah. Gosh. Or if only even we just the question. I mean, coming. people are asking these questions with AI, like mm. now, because it's it kind of woke people up. Maybe just been like, oh, I didn't notice we were there this fast. And it's like, is this a good idea? And it's like we're not trained to ask that question anymore. No one's mm -hmm. supposed to ask, is it a good idea? Yeah. It's yeah. can I do it? Yeah. And it's I mean, like that's that's yeah. the that's... disciplines being isolated from one another. And, and it's yeah. Jeff Goldblum's classic line in Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. You guys were right. so busy yeah. asking yourselves, what could you do? You never asked mm -hmm. yourselves, what should you do? Yeah. So, Cool. More Steve? Yeah. More Steve. More Steve. Let's hear him. If you contrast that to the way things are done on many of today's college campuses, people sign up for classes based on convenience. Uh, a philosophy major may line up in the gym to sign up for classes and see... Uh, a class starts at 11 a.m., so they jump at that because it looks great. It happens to be Kant. But as Dr. Gage has pointed out on many occasions, you don't start with Kant in philosophy. You're missing about 15 or 16 centuries of important stuff. Did he miss a Descartes joke there? Could he have set? Because could he have used Descartes and then said, "You're, you know, you don't want to put before the horse, the horse I before saw, Descartes." Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's the great conversation yeah. is a parade of ideas that has taken place through the centuries. And if you just jump into it uh, in a hodgepodge manner, you're going to miss out on all of the ideas uh, and concepts that that particular pe person is building on. So we read these works in their entirety. We read these works in a particular order. Uh, modernity has completely ignored the meta narrative. We do not. So that's a large part of this program. Mm. Finally, this program is rich. I, I will say this too, going back to Jordan Peterson, that is one of the things I think that is giving his voice a lot of power, a lot of meaning is that he is gesturing to that meta narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In philosophy. So as Dr. Gage is arguing both sides of an issue, um, he calls it playing devil's advocate. You're not going to know particularly which side he agrees with, and he's doing that intentionally. It's to challenge you to think for yourself and to think critically. That's a big part of a platonic education, and that is one of the main reasons why uh, you do need to extend Dr. Gage some philosophic immunity as he jumps on both sides of the fence, ultimately for your benefit. Hi, I'm Steve. Okay, so that, that actually takes us right back to the first clip in the premiere oh. Unbelievable podcast well they weren't saying it but he was highlighting the fact that you know he went to the church for help and the church was not equipped mm -hmm. to help him think through these issues and i wonder what you think about this given that you know i i know that dr gage gets into some trouble in evangelical circles um how and 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 the the pre the proper use of that philosophical immunity within maybe church ministry or discipleship or as we learn about theology um, mm -hmm. i feel like there's not a lot of tolerance um, for that philosophical approach within modern evangelical christianity maybe i'm being too harsh but i would i no i think i think there's there's truth in that i think that we've um we being like evangelical christianity uh have been burned maybe mm. by uh i mean hindsight's 2020 and you look back and look back and be like oh we allowed we did we did what what were churches mm. doing then mm. oh don't want to do that again and then that results in of course you have like you know watchdog kind of mm. ministries that arise from that that don't have a lot of grace you could just jump in and be like okay rah rah christianity and build a christian youtube mm -hmm. channel I don't really want to yeah. build a Christian YouTube channel. I want to build a YouTube channel based off of a conversation about theology, which I mm -hmm. think is the most meaningful mm -hmm. conversation we can have, and that all other mm -hmm. meaningful conversations flow from that conversation of theology. Yeah, um, I'm not particularly advocating for evangelical Christianity. Like I've said, I maybe even am a little bit harsh. <laughs> yeah. 
but um, I think it's really important to have these conversations online because I think that that is the marketplace of ideas today. If you've made it to the end of this video, I think that that means you and I, we have, there's a community of people out here that want to engage in these types of meaningful conversations. There's a lot out there. So the fact that you have spent your time with us is valuable. I really appreciate it. And if you have gotten value out of this discussion, and if you haven't subscribed, I would just ask you to subscribe. If you already have subscribed, I would ask you to find somebody you think who could benefit from this and share it with that person. Um, you don't get a whole lot of traction on YouTube and places like that. If you're listening to this on a podcast, find the YouTube video, hit the like button, share it with a friend. And really that way the community can generate more and more meaningful conversation rather than just doom scrolling the internet, you know. So I appreciate that you're here at the end of this video. Um, and I, again, love to hear, hear your thoughts on this conversation. Pretty committed to this and I want to make each video better and better and better. The more I do it, the more I learn. And so even though it's more of a podcast style, there's not a, light, a lot of lights and flashy things. Hopefully, uh, the quality is um, the quality matches the content. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. That's that's my goal. That's the goal. There is that the quality would match the content. So, thank you for being here and helping me do that.